Kepla Laboratories and Dentoscope Academy in association with Future Dent, FamDent Shows and FamDent Awards. We bring to you an extraordinary speaker today. Not only is he a personal friend of mine and a contemporary, but a very well-known, very, very uh, recognized and a great uh, laser specialist, Dr. Suchitan Pradhan. Dr. Suchitan Pradhan has been practicing in upmarket juve since several years now, and he's an authority on lasers. Today, he will be talking not only about lasers, but also will touch upon the protocols that we need to follow post-COVID in your clinics. I'm joined today by Dr. Samira Sheikh, an implantologist and prosthodontist and an associate in my clinic. She will be moderating the session today and she will take up from here. Over to you, Samira. Good evening and a warm welcome to all my dear friends. Friends, today's how-to session, it is gonna be extraordinary. We have divided this session into two parts. The first part will be focusing all about aerosols and how to tackle aerosols in our practice in COVID times. And the second part will deal with laser dentistry, uh, lasers, the use of lasers in surgical implant dentistry. And to talk about this, we have with us stalwart, a celebrity dentist, Dr. Suchetan Pradhan. Dr. Suchetan Pradhan has an extensive CV. I will just give a summary of it. Pradhan sir is president of Indian Academy of Laser Dentistry. He is director and mentor for Implant Fellowship Program at D.Y. Patil Institute and Manipal University. He is editor in chief of International Journal of Laser Dentistry. He has lectured and conducted courses extensively all over the world in approximately 28 countries, including the Harvard School of Dental Medicine. He is KOL for Evoclar, Densply Serona, Noble Biocare, and Biolase. So friends, let's take an insight from Dr. Suchetan Pradhan. Welcome, sir, and over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Anil, who's a friend of mine, and uh, Samira, who's been in who introduced me really nicely. Today, we are dividing our presentation into two different parts. The first part I will cover with, with, um, with, with what we have today, which is COVID. And um, just one second, huh? I, I, want, I want to open up my presentation. I'm going to share the screen. Uh oh, what happened to that? Let me go down and let me see what's up here. Okay. All right. So I'm just opening my presentation. Then we can then we can talk about what we are going to do today. Yes. So we're going to divide this into two different parts. One will be talking about the safe management of aerosols and droplets. The most important thing in COVID is the, the, the generation of aerosols that we have and we see in, in, in medical practices. And so let us understand what aerosols are first. Once we understand that, I'll give you a brief as to how you can improve the aerosol generations or decrease the aerosol generations in your practices and do safe practice management with them. The second part will cover, uh, as Samira has said, the surgical management with lasers in implant dentistry. And then if you have the time, I can even talk about aesthetics uh, in, um, with, with lasers. So um, Samira, can we go and start with the, with the slideshow? Samira, can you hear me? Yes, yes, sir, carry on. Yeah, okay. So the, the, the first step is to understand the safe management of aerosols and droplets. Can I, can I uh, minimize this because I'm getting a, a huge, uh, on, the, on the right side, I'm getting a, a, a large screen. If you minimize, then uh, we won't be able to see you. Oh, okay. But I can't minimize the rest of you guys? Uh, uh, yeah, just try. Not really. Puchitan, we are not visible on the screen. Only you are. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Then I'm fine. Okay. All right. So the principles are compassion because that's what we have to do because COVID is something that is going to be a part of our lives 
for the near future, at least until and unless we find a vaccine and or the virus disappears entirely. We have, we must trust in science and that's why this presentation and we must take quick actions to make sure that we do not, one, infect ourselves with, 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 with the COVID virus and or pass it on to our patients. So there is a lot of uncertainty in the literature, which is leading to anxiety. Nobody is really sure as to where it's coming from because it's a very, very new virus. And it has a lot of characteristics similar to the influenza virus and to the SARS and the MERS, but and some of them are very different. So it's hard to adjust if the science is never exact. But it's fundamentally important to understand the available information so that we can do safe practices in our clinics. So what are basically aerosols? What are the definition and what are the types of aerosols that you find? So what is an aerosol? First of all, it's a liquid or a solid particle suspended in air. It is visible as you can see in a fog or it could be more commonly invisible. For example, dust and pollen. And this is the more dangerous part of it, which harbors the bacteria and the viruses which we are concerned about. What are the types of aerosols? And both of these will affect us as to the way we practice in our clinics. There are large droplet aerosols and there are small droplet aerosols. Large droplet aerosols, because they are large in size, and we will come to what, uh, what is large and small, is that they drop to the ground due to gravity before evaporation. So then this results in local contamination and the disease transmission is then through droplets, which is a contact spread. And that is what we call as fomite transmission or the spray zone of patients, which will include coughing, sneezing, or just talking. So therefore, these are something that we are concerned about. But more importantly are the small droplets. They are so small that the buoyant forces overcome gravity and therefore they suspend it in the air for long periods. Or they, they evaporate before they hit the floor and they leave solid particulates to float freely for long distances and that is what causes airborne transmission. We are not sure Though the CDC has said that there is a possibility that there could be airborne transmission, but with the COVID, we are not sure. But because we are not sure, we got to be extra careful. So what is the point of contention between large and small droplets? It's the size cutoff. Again, there is a little bit of confusion here. Most authors will use less than five microns as a cutoff point, but some authors have said 10 some have said even 20 microns. The reality, however, is that in any activity, it results in a mixture of small and large droplets and hence both have to be considered and both have to be managed very, very well. So if you look at the aerosols and the distance and the, the, the they travel, the cough is less in terms of distance which is the aerosol, which are less than 10 microns, the, the, and, and the sneeze will travel much further. Exhalation, that is your normal breathing and talking, will also uh, expel aerosols and they will quickly fall to the ground. So please understand that even if the patient, even if you're not using dental procedures for aerosols, you still have, if the patient is positive, with the virus, you will still have in your environment a lot of the viral particles present or the viral RNA present. So what are the aerosol generating procedures that we see that could be regular? Like you can be breathing, you can be talking, you can be coughing, you can be sneezing. And of course, the distance that the aerosol particles travels will vary according to the activity that you're doing. And then of course, are the medical procedures which are a concern to us. So what are respiratory aerosols? It is created when air passes over a, a layer of fluid, which is doing a normal activity. So oral cavity mode is responsible for millimeter droplets and they will come from the lungs as well. 
and that is where the viruses are hidden and they will attack your bronchial passages and, and the lungs themselves. So what are the aerosol generating medical procedures? Anything that you use through the oral cavity will, will create an aerosol. So bronchoscopy will induce a cough in the respiratory tract, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, non-invasive ventilation, tracheal intubation, manual ventilation, surgery, sputum induction, nebulizer treatments, suctioning, and laser plume will all be responsible for creating aerosols. So again, when we are doing any of these procedures and we haven't come to the, uh, to the aerosols that are generated in dentistry, which is through your aerotors, through your micromotors, and so those ones we will talk about a little bit later. So what are the aerosol generating dental procedures? These are the commonly used dental procedures in our practices and the devices that we are using them for. Ultrasonic and sonic devices consider the greatest source of aerosol contamination. But use of a high volume evacuator will reduce the airborne contamination by more than 95%. And we know that it's the viral load which determines the severity of the condition. Lesser the viral load, more chances of you being asymptomatic or less symptomatic with less severe uh, uh, in, in infection. The higher the viral load, the more chances of you getting into severe respiratory distress and the, uh, and the conditions that follow uh, thereupon. Air polishing, that airborne contamination is nearly equal to that of ultrasonic scales. Air water syringe, again, bacterial counts, in, it is nearly equal to that of ultrasonic scales. Tooth preparation with air turbine, there's minimal if you use a rubber dam. So a rubber dam is an absolute must if you're doing an aerosol procedure. And tooth preparation with air abrasion, bacterial contamination is unknown, Extensive contamination with abrasive particles has been shown though. So we are not sure about the tooth preparation with air abrasion, but anything else that we are doing in our practices will generate aerosols. And so we have to make sure that we have in our clinic the sterilizing protocols that will reduce the amount of aerosols that there are. The important factor that it affects the aerosol generation is viscosity of fluids. That will happen because of increase in surfactants or surface tension. That means that it increases the overall droplet formations. And because it produces smaller droplets, it will spread farther. So therefore, your entire operatory is now a viral zone post any procedure that you do in your dental practice especially those that are creating aerosols or generating aerosols, like we said, with the dental uh, equipment that we use, including aerotors, including ultrasonic scalers. In contrast, nebulized salines has shown to decrease the number of aerosols produced, but it's not proven. So that's something that we will have to look at in the future. What are the sources of aerosols? Respiratory inspections are the primary source surgical procedures, dental procedures, and mundane procedures. And this is so important in Mumbai. Even fast running tap waters can generate aerosols and flushing toilets. And therefore, where people are sharing a common toilet, you're seeing a lot of infections coming out of there. So what is exactly the clinical significance of the aerosols? The disease causing potential of aerosols depends upon a lot of factors. The amount of aerosol produced, the size of the droplets, as we saw anything which is a small droplet size, which is less than five microns in diameter will travel further. The frequency of the activity. So the more that you use your dental equipment, the more the aerosol generation will happen. Concentration of the infectious agents. How infected is the patient? What is his viral load is extremely important to understand. What is the virulence of the microbes? If we know that the COVID-19 
virulence depends from population to population and that will all depend upon the type or, or of virus that, that, that we're dealing with and also the concentration of the infectious agents. And the environmental factors which we have to modify in our practices to, to ensure that these aerosols don't stay there for long. And the host immunity and health. So please, my friends, be extremely fit in these very difficult times and make sure that your immunity is at the highest possible levels. So take whatever uh, steps that you want, exercise regularly, that's the best way to be uh, healthy and, and, and your immunity will increase. And of course, take supplements that you may need to protect yourself and the community at large. So the amount of aerosol produced depends on the droplet size and the frequency of activity, activities that are producing them. So the more times that you use the same procedure, the more the aerosol generation will happen and therefore the viral load will also increase. What are exhaled aerosols? Humans primarily produce large droplets, but recent research shows that 80 to 90% of particles generated by humans is smaller than one micron in size. But they are sufficiently small to remain airborne. And because they remain airborne, air transmission is a distinct and real possibility. So what are the number of droplets produced? And what are the small ones? The large droplets will normally drop to the floor and are easier to control and to sterilize and to treat and, and to destroy. So normal breathing will have a few number of droplets, very small number of uh, small aerosols. A single small nasal exhalation, few to a hundred, counting out loud, few dozen to five, few hundred, a cough, few hundred to many thousands, and a sneeze, few hundred thousand to a few million. So therefore, and, and the last three mostly contain small aerosols, which are less than one to two microns. Now, so therefore, if a patient who's infected is symptomatic, there are more chances of him transmitting, transmitting the disease to you because he's going to cough and he's going to sneeze. So to protect that, you, you also need to do a proper history of the patient to protect yourself when he comes into the clinic. So the number of particles, and this is a very interesting uh, 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 slide as you can see, number of particles in different initial diameters emitted in one cough and one sneeze. So if you look at the diameter range, the, the, the range that is really we are concerned with is, is somewhere between one and 24. And that's where if you see the maximum number of particles are being emitted and so therefore be careful. Speech is potentially of much greater concern than breathing for two reasons. The particles on average are larger and thus could potentially carry, carry a larger number of pathogens and much, much greater quantities of particles. So therefore, compared to breathing, of, of course. So therefore, even when your patient is talking to you, maybe it would be a good idea to ask them to wear a mask. Simply talking in a loud voice would increase the rate at which an infected individual releases pathogens into the air. And the percentage of airborne nuclei by singing is 16 times as much than normal talking. So if you're, a, if you're singing, uh, uh, if, a, if a singer is singing and he's infected next to you, there are more chances of you contacting the disease, contracting the disease. But the frequency of activity is directly proportional to the amount of aerosol produced. So even though a single cough produces more droplets than a single breath, but you breathe regularly and therefore the amount of droplet production may be more. There is a concept called super producers. So the amount of bioaerosol depends on the individual. So it is individual dependent. So a very minor percentage of the population is responsible for disseminating the majority of exhaled aerosols. And these are the super spreaders of infections. And this we know from our experience with SARS and with COVID-19. So if you look at the number 
of patients infected by the, uh, 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 sorry, the number of particles created by the super producers, you will see that it's completely deferring. Some will only do 14, which is the minimum, and some will do 33,230. So individual super producers are something that we also need to be concerned about. Other aerosols that we can generate are because of vomiting, that's self-explanatory, and very importantly, in, especially in a place like India, where toilets are shared, flush toilets, 100 million virus particles per, per gram of feces. And that, there's a, there's a very typical uh, example of that was in the Amoy Garden apartment complex in Hong Kong, where the SARS spread quite distinctively. So what are the procedural aerosols in dentistry? Ultrasonic scalers, like we said, air polishing, air water syringes, and tooth preparation. The contamination will be the amount of aerosol, greater than the amount of aerosol contamination, and will be dependent on how often and how much you use this. So the aerosol do droplet size determines the fate of an aerosol. Large droplets will transmit through fomite or contacts so that if the large droplets drops on the surface and you touch that surface and you then touch that surface, the, the hand that touches the surface or the part of the body that touches the surface onto your face, your nose, your mouth or your eyes, then you're likely to contact, contract the disease. The small droplets will only have airborne or transmission. But all there's a rider here. Large droplets can become smaller and can result in airborne transmission as well. As well. So the droplet bond route, as you can see, the foam, this is the droplet bond route. So you cough, there's a person standing over there, the virus hits him, uh, I mean, the droplet hits him, and he inhales the droplet, and that droplet then uh, transmits the virus. That is that's the short range airborne route, which is transmitted by aerosols. And that's why you come to a safe distance when you're talking to somebody. When you talk about social distancing and safe distance, that is what we're talking about. The fomite route is what I explained, that the, that the droplet drops on the, on, on, on the surface. You touch the surface with your hand and you use that hand to touch your face. And that is the, um, that is the fomite route. And what is really not understood so much is the long range airborne route, which is transmitted by aerosols. And that is what we are concerned about a lot. So, so what is the fate of an aerosol? The primary factor is the size of the droplets and determines how long it can remain in the air and how far can it travel. And if you look at this, uh, this chart, you see that if the size of the droplets is a thousand microns, which is one millimeter, and the distance covered is one meter, and the time taken to fall is only 0.3 seconds. As you go, go down the chart, you will see that the time taken to fall will increase and this, as the size of the droplets reduces. So at one micron size, which is, so we are looking at three microns to one micron size of the virus, you're looking at 30,000 seconds, which is in hours. And that is what you're contaminating the environment around. And that is why it is significant for the healthcare worker that you sterilize the operatory environments very well. So distribution of droplets is influenced by the ventilation patterns and weights. And so therefore, ventilation and filtration of the air is extremely important. So initial velocity of the droplets, the relative humidity, we, the higher the humidity, then, then you're gonna have um, the droplets dropping down quicker. Temperature, the higher the temperature, the more chances of the virus being, uh, uh, being killed. The shape of the human body and the droplet size nuclei and composition. These are all dynamic factors. The, 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 the calculations are very difficult. And we're not talking about just one factor here. These are all factors which are combined together. This is a close up view of an emission from a healthy person during a sneeze. During a sneeze. Actual duration is 0.25 seconds. So the droplet dispersion rate is, initial studies 
assume droplets were introduced in the air without velocity, but that's a bad assumption because coughing and sneezing have tremendous initial particle velocities. Normal breathing will be one meter, talking will be five meters per second, coughing will be 10 meters, and sneezing will be 20 to 50 meters per second. So think about this as walking on the sea on, 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 by, walk by the sea on a windy day, and you can see the amount of spray that you can see that happens around from the sea. So the mathematical model that predicts the distance traveled by the, uh, as two meters, that is mostly ac applicable for normal breathing and talking, coughing and sneezing, but this is applicable only for small droplets. Smaller droplets, and that is really a concern, can travel large distances. Covering the mouth, and that is why use of masks, even when you're talking to somebody, is so important, makes the risk of seven to eight meters less likely. So therefore, please protect yourself with masks at all times. So again, if you look at normal breathing and talking, they, they can evaporate and become small droplets. They remain in the air because the small droplets remain in the air for a long time. They can change based on temperature, humidity, and also your ventilation, which is extremely important. And coughing and sneezing can propel the large droplets much further. Okay, so let's now, the degree of danger depends on the size, but also of the volume of air in which it is produced. So what are the implications for dentistry? They are very severe because we are working with aerosols generating procedures all the time. So please, so when you're doing your sterilization, make sure that the environment is also being given time to recover from the viral loads. So what is the concentration of the virus? The, although the majority of the droplets may be small enough to stay airborne, their small size means that collectively, they only add up to a tiny fraction of the volume produced, and therefore only a tiny fraction of the virus spread. S smaller droplets don't contain as many microorganisms as larger droplets to cause a clinical infection. That was what we thought in 2009, 2005, with the articles that you can see here. But we must remember also that not every, so there is a, there is a silver lining. Not every droplet contains virus, viruses, okay? And even if it does, the viral load may not be enough to transmit the disease, and it will all depend on the virulence factor of the virus. COVID-19 is a pretty virulent virus. So let's look quickly at influenza. I don't want to go too much into detail of influenza. Was it droplet or airborne? Both the influenza had both large and small droplets. We have to learn from the historical uh, transmissions that we've been observing. So there was a large droplet contact, uh, contact transmission mostly responsible for the disease transmission. Okay, so influenza virus was found in uh, air around an emergency department in flu season and one showed, study showed 43 samples were positive. The total amount of virus found in samples worn, uh, worn by the healthcare workers was twice that of in the air. And the viral loads very high close to the patient, but was also detected two millimeters away. Influenza spreads mostly due to close contact, but airborne transmission is possible. What about COVID? Is it droplet or airborne? Coronaviruses can, not definitively, we are not sure, but can, but we assume that they can be spread by airborne transmission just to be safe. They are similar to Mars and SARS, but and they are spread largely by small, uh, by, by large droplets. And, but certain out outbreaks could be best explained only by airborne spread. So again, we got to be careful. So let's look at the SARS transmission. And the, the most common example of that was the MI Garden apartment, which was airborne spread through the sewer system. And that is, again, something that we in Mumbai will be very concerned about. So the higher floors were more likely to get infected, consistent with a, with a plume of warm contaminated air. So there was a strong association between multiple aerosol generating procedures and transmission of SARS to healthcare workers. And we are the first line of attack for the virus. The COVID-19 transmission was found in the air more than six feet away from the patient in ventilation systems. 
in hallways outside patient rooms, indicating potential for airborne transmission. And these are all very recent articles, some of them coming from Italy, some of them coming from China, which has seen the most devastating effect of, these, of this virus. So what is, how does it spread? You're coughing, the droplets containing the virus fall on the floor, the large particles, the smaller ones are airborne. Those airborne particles can land in your nose, mouth, and possibly lungs. The, the droplets, you touch them, and then you eventually, they go in through the, through, the, uh, through the nose and the mouth. You also have an oral fecal uh, uh, transmission, oral fecal transmission. Viral RNA was found up to four meters from the patient. That's about 12 feet. And that's not possible to socially distance 12 feet all the time. If the COVID is aerosolized in large numbers, the virus remains viable for at least three to five hours. So the CDC guidance is COVID is airborne as a precautionary measure, okay? Infection control. So what can we do to protect ourselves? Very importantly, keep washing your hands because the one thing that is in our favor that soap detergent and water can get rid of the virus. So the first step in managing aerosols is very importantly good ventilation. 65% of all airborne droplets can be removed with each air exchange and that is ideal. Okay, but realistically we get about 20 to 60%. Each air exchange may take away half the aerosols in the room. So therefore ventilation is very important. Air disinfection. We have lots of ways of doing it. And uh, maybe in the future, I'll, I, I may have a presentation which talks about what are the ways of doing air, air, air disinfection and what we can do individually in our clinics. We have HEPA filters, we have UVC lights, which will reduce the bacteria, the, the viral counts in the environment. The most important mechanism though for it, the healthcare workers is as we are all doing in our practices when we treat emergencies is to use PPEs. The PPEs must cover you from head to toe. There should be not a single part of your body exposed to the environment because the large droplets can settle there and then you touch them eventually and then you touch your face, you're gonna get infected. Well-fitting N95 plus masks are also extremely uh, 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 viable, Alternate, uh, alternative for the mask that we've used with the surgical mask that we are using. And these are the minimum for healthcare workers that we would recommend. The four meter rule, what are the other uh, options? The two meter rule is not reliable because as we saw, four meters can also can have uh, the viral contamination. However, the concentration of droplets will decrease as the distance increases. Very importantly, the PPE should be taken away as far from the patient as possible, or taken off. When you remove the PPEs, they should be taken away as far away from the patient as possible, behind the screen or a door. Increasing the distance reduces the risks from the droplets, but it increases the risk of contact spread from the PPEs. So if you have a dedicated PPE removal room, then that will help. Or if you have an empty room or behind a curtain, that will not spread it through the airborne route, then you should remove the PPEs over there. You should follow the heightened hygiene procedures. Please keep washing your hands. And that way you will be able to ensure that the, the virus on your hands is eliminated. So thank you very much for that part of my presentation. I hope that it was useful to understanding of what we are dealing with, with this extremely dangerous virus. And I hope you all will, will, will take adequate precautions, stay safe, and only do emergency procedures till the virulence of the virus is reduced or till the areas that you're living in will have peaked and the, viral, uh, the virus seems to be on a decline. So again, thank you very much for that. I'm now gonna start on my other presentation.
Samira, do I have to? Uh, Samira? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Um, uh, I will have to share that. Just open it and share the screen, right? Yes, yes. But if I open it and it doesn't share the screen, let me see. Safe management. No, I'm not getting that. Do I have to dis disconnect and then join again? Is that how it works? No, no, no. Just open the presentation on your desktop and then uh, share the screen. Okay, but then I will have to move this up. Okay, just give me a second. Okay. All right. Now I have to go to share screen. Yeah. Okay, so this part of the presentation is completely different from what we just spoke about. It's for the rationale for the use of lasers and hard and soft tissues in dentistry, but specifically, we're going to be talking about. But specifically, we're going to be talking about the use of lasers in implant dentistry, and then if you have some time, and if you're interested, we could we could do a bit of aesthetic dentistry. Um, So that's the text, that's a chapter in the textbook that I've written. It's uh, published by Springer. It's called Lasers and Dentistry Current Concepts uh, by uh, editors are Don Kaluzi and Stephen Parker. And that is my contribution uh, to the world of, uh, of dentistry as of now. Ordinary light is electromagnetic radiation that is visible to the human eye and is responsible for the sense of sight. Visible light is multi-wavelength in the range of about 380 to 740 nanometers between the invisible infrared with longer wavelengths and the invisible ultraviolet, which shot of it. So are you there? I think he has lost the connection. Friends, just some technical glitches. We will get back soon. Just have patience for some time. Sorry for this uh, inconvenience.
uh, Anil sir, uh, the internet is disconnected. You can take some questions in between. Dr. Suchitin will be back. I think there's a little connectivity issue. Just bear with us for a couple of minutes. Yeah, yeah. I think. Now? Yeah. Yeah, Suchitin, you're, you're on now. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. So when did we where did we stop? Is it is are we all, am I still on? Anil, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. sir. It's clear now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So how much okay. back did, did he did, it stop? did you see the video? Down, down. No, no, no. Okay, you didn't see the laser video, right? No. Okay. So he has did to you... start from the laser video, no? Yes. Okay. okay. I have to start from the laser video, right? Okay, so I'll share it. Let's go ahead. Play. You didn't see this, right? Before? Yes. Yes. Ordinary light is electromagnetic radiation that is visible to the human eye and is responsible for the sense of sight. Visible light is multi-wavelength in the range of about 380 to 740 nanometers between the invisible infrared with longer wavelengths and the invisible ultraviolet with shorter wavelengths. Light is multi-wavelength, has scattered divergent beams, and has little energy. The term laser originated as an acronym for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Laser light has several features that are significantly different from white light. To begin with, light from most sources spreads out as it travels so that much less light hits the given area as the distance from the light source increases. The light travels as a parallel beam and spreads very little. Furthermore, lasers are devices that produce intense beams of light, which are monochromatic, coherent, and highly collimated. Lasers typically have very low divergence, travel over great distances, or can be focused to a very small spot. Because of these properties, lasers are used in a wide variety of applications in all walks of life. In 1915, Neil Bohr proposed that a quantum of energy... So, lasers can be used in dentistry, for sure. What, what areas of dentistry? Perio, endo, oral surgery, implant dentistry, pediatric dentistry, prosthodontics and aesthetic dentistry, orthodontics. That means in every walk of dentistry, you will be able to use lasers and benefit your patients. Lasers and implant dentistry is what we're going to talk about today only. And that's, is that a perfect marriage? It's two different species. One which loves heat, lasers create heat, and one which hates heat, which is implants. How do they two gel together? Let's have a look. So laser wavelengths in dentistry are soft tissues, that includes diode lasers for soft tissues, CO2, NDAG, and erbium chromium biosgs can be used in soft tissues, and the heart tissue or the erbium family of lasers, which are the biosgg and the erbium YAG lasers. So this is what you would use in your clinical practices. What are the advantages over conventional techniques? You obtain much better visualization because there's reduced bleeding, there's a reduced duration of procedure because of a, a better visualization, there's a reduced bacterial count 
during and after surgery. There is a complication and infections are reduced significantly. There's a high quality of healed tissues, no scar tissue, no retraction and discoloration, and there's a high tissue potential for regeneration after laser, laser irradiation. What is interesting is, can we reduce the bacterial count or the viral count with during or after surgery when in the times of COVID? This is something that we need to, 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 to study and to see and, and to take samples and do, which I hope somebody will do. Uses of lasers in implant dentistry, from the pre-surgical to the surgical, post-surgical for low level laser therapy, prosthetic phase and for peri-implantitis. What we are gonna concentrate on is the surgical aspects of lasers in implant dentistry, which will be during the surgical, pre-surgical and the prosthetic phase. So the pre-surgical applications are very simple to do. A phrenectomy or a vestibuloplasty to alleviate any tension on the tissues around the implant site. And that, if you're a practicing implant dentist, you know how difficult that is to do on a predictable basis. And the advantages of this are the ability to remove tissue without bleeding, swelling, or any post-operative or lessened post-operative pain. So in a case like this, where you see a very high phenol attachment, we're gonna do imaged implants for this case of, uh, of, of, of oral trauma, um, that there is a very high phenol line. So when, if you do an Im imaged implant there, then the phrenum will cause a lip pull and there will be an ingress of bacteria and causes of secondary infection around the implants. So you can do a phrenectomy, it takes about 30 seconds to a minute to do, and that will really alleviate the uh, lip pull uh, and the pull of the flap away from the tissues. So the indications for phrenectomy are this. If you have a tight gingiva, which is less than three, two millimeters, then, you, then if there is a phrenal pull, then you will definitely need to do a phrenectomy. You could either do a conventional surgical technique or use lasers. If it is not, then of course it's not indicated. So while we're placing the implant in after we've done the laser, we place the implants, we pack bone around this, we suture up, and then this is three months post-operative healing. And as you can see, we have a beautiful healing potential of the tissues. You can even do a vestibuloplasty. We were going to place uh, implants in this patient. And as you can see, he has very high uh, uh, muscle attachments, and phenol attachment. So it's very easy to do a phrenectomy so that when you place the implants in, there is no lip pull and that there will be no ingress of bacteria in that area and there will be no tearing of the flap either. So no, no opening of the flap either. So as you can see, we have done the phrenectomy. You actually use the laser. I'm gonna show you a video post this. This is on day one. And this is two weeks post-operative and you can see a beautiful attached gingiva creation. So this is one case and that's, that's the video to show you how to do a vestibuloplasty. So we start from the area where the attachment of the muscles are and I'm going to progressively go give an incision and if you can appreciate that there is very good visualization as we reach the periosteum. Once you reach the periosteum, you are going to get a periosteal bleed, but make sure that you will score the periosteum to create a second attachment zone for the soft tissue so that we can, we can get a, a proper band. So I'm going to go forward because it's a very long video. Now I'm scoring the periosteum, as you can see. This is the periosteum I'm storing around this area. And that is where our final attachments we will anticipate we will, we will have. So in, this is in the mandible. Let me go a little bit forward. That is the setting on the laser. And this is the final surgical protocol we are again going on the right side to score the periosteum. There you can see the periosteum score. 
And that is virtually the end of the procedure. There are two ways of, of, of doing this. One is once you've done this, you can interpose a pre-gingival uh, graft there so that you don't have a falling back but or, of the tissues. But we have found that it's really not needed to give even a suture, but the patient has a little bit of soreness post uh, the procedure. There's not a lot of pain, but there is a, a certain degree of soreness of the patient. Here. And that is absolutely the, the end of the protocol that we are going to be looking at. And there you can see the periosteal score. There's a slight oozing, so I'm going to go and do a little bit of hemostasis there for the ooze. And this is the final. That is the final of the protocol. This is after 24 hours for the vestibuloplasty. And you can see the bottom two slides of a 72 hour healing. And as you can see, the healing is, is really quick. That is one week post operative. I would say it will take about two weeks for the total healing of the tissues. And now you have a different band of the attached gingiva. As you can see, the metal wire they're showing you where we can anticipate the, uh, uh, the final uh, uh, attached gingiva. Uh, uh, the way you can see the mobile mucosa attaching where the wire is seen. And I'll show you some cases with a long-term follow-up a little bit later. So this implant surgery, you can use lasers to prepare the implant site with minimal trauma to the hard and soft tissue. And the removal of both soft and hard tissue is precise and it's minimally invasive. So what are the surgical applications that we use in lasers? You have incision making and flap raising. You can use a scalpel. I prefer using a laser because your know, vision is better and there's less uh, post-operative, uh, 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 less post-operative, uh, I mean, intraoperative bleeding. There's disinfection of the extraction socket for immediate implant placement. You can do the osteotomy site preparation. Really, it's not very accurate as of now, but we hope in the future that we can develop that to a better degree. You can do the disinfection of the osteotomy site, which is very important because before you place your implants in, if you can disinfect the site, then your potential for healing is increased immensely. You can do bone remodeling and contouring, which is always necessary around implants. You can do soft and hard tissue harvesting, and you can also use biomodulation to enhance the healing potential of the tissues in, around the implants. What is the advantages of laser incision? incision? It's a sterile cut. There are no cascade of inflammation, uh, inflammatory events. It seals off the lymphatics and blood vessels and therefore reduces pain, swelling, and other post-operative complications. There are excellent hemostatic properties, fewer myofibrils as compared to, uh, to scalpel wounds. So therefore, the healing is much, much better. Preparation of surgical sites it's important in post-surgical extraction, uh, post-extraction decontamination, and very important in imaged implant placement. If it was not for lasers, a lot more imaged implants would get infected, especially in our practices. So the goal is to eliminate all the disease soft tissue and decontaminate the bony surfaces within the site. For this, the erbium wavelengths are ideal. So in sum, Immediate implant placements, when there is infected bone and you use the laser, you want to leave the surfaces bleeding. So when you place your implants in, your implant is going into a blood clot, which, which is an implant surrounded, surrounded by blood clots and that enhances the healing of the socket. So the laser incision and flap, as you can see, it's typically as non-invasive as that. Then when you open up the flap and you're going to place implants in, you find that where the bone should have healed is a residual cyst. So when you're going, how would you clean that? The best way to do it, to use a laser, to decontaminate the site and also to extirpate the cyst. Then you remove the granulation tissue. You can use a laser, you can use a, 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 a excavators or you can use a, uh, 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 any other instrument that you feel comfortable with. Then you decontaminate 
the infected site, and then you start placing your implants in, place your implants in, you get primary stability with more than 50 newtons of torque here in this case, the implants are placed, you do bone grafting, and then you can put a membrane on top, and then you suture up, and this is two weeks post-operative, and you can see the surgical sites looks really nice. Creating a tad gingiva is again something that you can do surgically with a laser. This is a technique that we have developed. If you can see, this is an implant in the posterior mandible. And there, where the buccinator muscle, muscle attachments are extremely high, uh, you can see that when you uh, punch the tissues around there and you place an abutment, you will find that when you pull the, the cheek, the tissues will move away. This is a pathway for bacterial contamination. So how do you treat this? You could do a conventional scalpel surgery to create a band of attached gingiva, but we have a simpler technique. You use a laser, the same way that you will use a vestibuloplasty for uh, the anterior mandible or the anterior maxilla. You will go in and you remove the tissues around, okay? And then you will notch the periosteum. The periosteum where you want the attached gingiva to begin, that's where you will notch the periosteum. So you're creating a band of secondary intention healing. That is extremely important for us to understand. So seven days post-operative, this is how it looks. And you can see how nice the results you can get with a laser. <clears throat> you can even do bone harvesting. So thermal damage to heart tissues is minimal if the proper technique is used. So this is a mandibular, mandibular torus, which we excised with an obium laser, an obium YSDG laser. And I was surprised as how quickly this does it. It probably does it quicker than your normal uh, uh, surgical burns. And that's, that's the whole torus in one. And you can even use this to graft around the implants that you're gonna place simultaneously. You could even do it for donor site preparations, for grafting in the mental areas or any other areas that you want. So you make a notch with your laser, you go in, uh, in, 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 in deeper in, and then you can just take your, 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 your surgical instruments and remove the, 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 the bone that needs so the, the, the donor bone can be removed like this very easily. And the healing potential of this is pretty good. You can use this for the lateral window sinus graft procedures. I'm going to show you a video of this. You have to be very careful here that when you see the shadow of the membrane, you've got to stop. Because if you don't, you can potentially harm the membrane. So you have to be careful. That is the technique that you have. Now you can see that we have opened up a window. We are removing the a window bone around it. There are some areas that I need to do a little bit more. And then you will do your regular uh, uh, sinus lift procedures. So this is a preoperative CBCT. So once you've removed the windows, then you would do your regular procedures, lifting up the membrane, packing it with bone and uh, placing that implant in if you like simultaneously. So this is the preoperative CBCT. We have only four millimeters of bone. This is postoperative CBCT. These are 11.5 millimeter implants. And you can see in the lower part of the CBCT that, that, that the implant is fully covered with, with, with bone and the membrane is intact. And this was also done with a laser. You can, and this is another case. You open up the lateral window, use the erbium laser, 
and then you remove the, um, uh, the, 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 the lateral window or, or wall. You can either infracture or you can outfracture. In this case, we've outfractured it. If you infracture it, then your, 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 your window bone will go into the uh, sinus and in the outfracture, you're removing it and using that uh, bone for either for, for, for augmentation, for grafting, you crush the bone and you graft it, or you use that as a window once you've placed, you put that window back in. So these are the two options available to us. So sinus lift, with, that's the case with immediate implant placement, preoperative OPG. So as you can see, that we've done simultaneous implant placement with the sinus lift. We've taken the implant level impression and you can see beautiful soft tissue healing around the implants. So this is a very predictable result that we can use a laser wand as well. Now, there's something that we can do with immediate implants and I'm gonna show you one or two indicative uh, uh, cases of each uh, procedure. So what are the criteria of the selection? If you have granulation tissue, you have periapical pathology, you have mild to moderate periodontitis. You could do the conventional surgical technique and use a delayed implant placement. But if you have lasers, you could do granulation tissue removal with the laser. You could do bone contamination with the laser. The granulation tissue removal can be, can be done with, with even soft tissue lasers, but the bone decontamination can be only done with the erbium family of lasers. And then you can go ahead and do your imaging implant placement. So an anterior implant case, you can see a fractured, um, you can see a fractured central incisor, immediate implant placement and a temporization given. This is after the implant has been placed. You have a soft tissue and emergence profile. We can also develop the emergence profile of the laser with this. And I will show you some immediate implant cases for full arches a little bit later on. You place the zirconia abutments, you prepare the other two teeth for veneers because that was the need for the patient. These are the provisionals. This is the soft tissue healing po post laser crown lengthening. So we equate the zeniths of all the three teeth together. One is an implant and the other two are teeth, of course. And this is the final prosthesis in the patient's mouth. So a nice aesthetic result. And that soft tissue that you see a little bit dragged away is, is gonna grow back in. And I'll show you some other cases where you, you see how much soft tissue can grow if you give it support. In the near future, in, in, in about six weeks, you will have a full soft tissue closure. Another case, and this is a case, which is a very old case because I wanted to show you a long-term follow-up. You have a bridge uh, and this is a preoperative and there is a bridge on uh, two, 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 three, and two, four or joint crowns but it's iatrogenic dentistry. As you can see, there is a post in the fore, which is not even in the tooth structure. So there's a lot of infection and we've had to extract a traumatically all of these teeth. Now we're gonna place two implants and make a three unit bridge on this particular patient. So when we remove this, we clean this whole area with a laser. We, we use a laser to clean up the granulation tissue and to decontaminate the bone with your erbium laser. So now you have a nice, fresh, healthy, bleeding bone, okay? And then you start your drilling protocol for the laser. You will place your, I'm sorry, for, for the implants. You will place your implants in, you will place your bone graft. You will then place a membrane around it. As you can see, we're placing, and these are all uh, DFDBs or demineralized freeze-dried bone. And this is a type two collagen membrane that we are using. And then we suture around it, immediate post-operative placement. Uh, the, then is, this is immediate post-operative OPG. Remember, this is 10 years back. We didn't have a CBCT in those days. Two months post two months post-operative. And you can see now the healing is great, but you do not have a papilla. So I want to generate a papilla to get good aesthetics. So we do implant opening with an impression post. We place the abutments. One is zirconia for aesthetic reasons. One is uh, titanium for, uh, and those days we used to do cemented restorations more than screw retained. So, and the other one is, uh, is a titanium abutment because of e economic reasons. We do, then this is immediate post cementation. And you're looking at me and saying, what are you talking about? Look at the amount of space anterior. But this, see what happens after six weeks. If you support the soft tissues, you will get soft tissue growth. 
You can do low level laser therapy to enhance that. But even if you don't, if you have, this is the, uh, the turn off principle, if you soft tissue will grow up to five millimeters. And this was about three millimeters. And this is six weeks down the line. This is six weeks down the line. This is eight years down the line. Still the soft tissue is in the same position. We haven't even done the scaling. This is just before the scaling to show you that this is how stable, well done implant dentistry can be in a long-term perspective. So then this is 10 years down the line. So a good uh, uh, aesthetic result for this patient. This is a complex restorative case with a vestibuloplasty and crown lengthening around implants as well. This is the preoperative uh, photograph of the patient. This is preoperative. You can see that there is a canine and there is a fractured 1-4 and 1-5. One, one so we're going to extract the 1-4, one, 1-5 one, and the impacted 1-3. Uh, and then we're going to place implants over there and we're going to do a full arch rehabilitation for this patient. We would also want to do uh, We would also want to treat the, 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 the lower five, the four five, and then you're going to do implants in the other areas as well. So, okay. So now we've done the extraction and the bone graft for the patient, and we've placed implants in the second and the third quadrants. And after we've after the bone graft, because as you can imagine, once you extract the three, four, and five, you're going to have not much, not much bone left there. So we have to do a grafting procedure as well. And then we place the implants in the patient's mouth. And these are the implants placed. And we're doing a retreatment of the five, the four, five. Vestibular plus. But now when we, when we try to uh, do the prosthesis, we find that there is no attached gingiva. So we have to do a vestibuloplasty in that region before we can actually load the implants. Otherwise, you will have a food trap over there and the patient will have a lot of peri-implantitis situation. So, and we do anterior crown lengthening for aesthetic purposes. We do a soft and hard tissue crown lengthening. This is a tissue healing after that. And this is a flapless technique some other time we could talk about aesthetic crown length. And then this is the final prosthesis in the patient's mouth. And this is the post-operative uh, uh, CVCT of the patient. And that is the happy patient at the end. And that's the last part of my presentation that is implants in the edentulous uh, zone. So we're doing a lot of immediate loading protocols also, as well as immediate uh, implantation protocols as well. So in this case, we are doing an immediate loading. This is maxillary preoperative. We, are, we have placed the implants. We're taking the impression for the temporization, immediate postoperative, and low-level laser therapy to enhance the healing potential. And again, this is the, uh, I don't, just don't have the time to talk about this, but uh, this is something that we could have a whole day lecture on, which is that there is a high overall significance for wound healing, tissue regeneration, and pain with low level laser therapy uh, or bio uh, stimulation or biomodulation. And then we place the lower implants. These are immediate implants, and these are immediate implants and immediately loaded. This is seven days post operative healing. This is a temporary prosthesis in the patient's mouth. This is three months. Again, I'm showing you this case because I want to show you long term results with it. And this is the final impressions. We are doing a sectional bridge on the upper. We are doing a, uh, a, a screw retained implant bridge on the lower. This is a maxillary sectional prosthesis divided into three parts, two to three, two to two, and three to three, and three to three, uh, three to six, and three to six on either side. And then this is a mandibular hybrid prosthesis. And you, you can see the screw access holes there. And this is the final prosthesis cemented and screw retained in the lower. In the mandible, and this is the preoperative and postoperative OPG. Three year recall, soft tissue profile after you remove the lower prosthesis, 
and you can see the patient has maintained reasonably good oral hygiene. This is without doing any scaling at all. And this is the CBCT of the upper arch, you can see, and then the CBCT of the lower arch. And you can see that the implants are all uh, very nicely integrated. Another case, and this was a very difficult case because what the, when the patient came to us, the patient came like this. And you can see that all the implants that were placed in the patient's mouth are infected. The most difficult patients to treat are, of course, those that you need to do retreatments for. So we had to first remove the implants. As you can see, all the implants in the lower jaw and the CBCT are infected. But though, and then this is preoperative. When we remove the implant, you can see the amount of damage that infection can do to bone. The bone has been completely eroded. And this is after, and then we remove the implants. We waited for three months. Of course, we can't do a bone graft even in this situation. We waited for three months, did the bone graft for her. And this is six months down the line after implant removal, and then three months down the line from the bone augmentation procedures. And now we have a decent amount of bone to place the implants in. We're gonna do five implants for her. We're gonna do imaged implants in the 404 region. And uh, as you can see, you can see the implants in a CBCT. So in a three-dimensional CBCT, you can see the placement of these implants. These are all done without a guide. These are uh, manual, so with my, with my hands. And that's how they look. And then again, you see that there is no uh, uh, attached gingiva. So we have to do a vestibular plasty. Otherwise, when you place the prosthesis, you will have a food trap underneath there. And the patient will not be able to keep that clean, even if you have a convex uh, 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 intaglio surface of the, of the prosthesis. So this is again a video of the dacular incision. I will show you layer by layer. So we can't go behind beyond that point because of course the mental forum and is present there. So we are going layer by layer and what you can appreciate is how little there is uh, bleeding or virtually none. You will not have any bleeding in the fibrous tissues, but when you hit the periosteum, because it's highly uh, uh, vascular, you will get some bleeding, but you can easily control it with your knee. Now we are reaching the periosteum. Again, let's go on the other side because we've appreciated this. Okay. You will denude the, the, the entire uh, uh, fibrous tissue all the way up to the periosteum. And then only where you want the attached gingiva to form will you then score the periosteum. So you want secondary intention healing at that point, not anywhere else. Everywhere else, you want primary intention healing or laser healing, which is akin to primary intention. Because what you're doing when you score the periosteum is you're denuding the blood supply to that area 
And so therefore, you will have a secondary injection to remove the bag. There you can see we are storing the periosteum, and that's what you're getting your periosteal bleed from. That is the final. And remember, this is a very vascular area because it is where a lot of the, lot of the, the capillary nexus is. It's, it's an, and this is after one month, and you can see that we've got a beautiful area of attached gingiva over there. So this is a very predictable procedure. Uh, I've been doing it now for many, many years and with, with great predictable results, long-term predictable results. So this is three months post-recovery, post-operative. And now we have to open the implants. You can either use a flap, and that's another invasive procedure. Patients don't like that or you can use lasers. So in this case, I'm going to use a laser to open it. It's a long video, but I'm going to cut it short. I'm just going to show you how easy it is. The first thing to do is to mark the implant. If you mark the midpoint of the implant or where the cover screw is, the center point, which is, that's exactly what I'm doing now. So I'm marking the, the midpoint of the cover screw and then I just go around it. And I have opened it very well. You can even use a diode laser. This is the, on the other side. We thought we could do one side erbium laser, one side diode, and to see how the healing would be different. And is there any significant difference in the healing potential of the two different wavelengths of lasers? And this is the diode laser we are doing. It looks a little lot angrier than the erbium laser. Again, the same principle, you mark the midpoint of the cover screw and then you go around that area and then you use your diode laser and then we go forwards a little bit because, yeah. This is actual video time, huh? which is about, it takes about 10 minutes to open up these. Uh, this is a full ass case, as you know. There's six implants in there. And this is the last one with the dial. Sometimes you need to use anesthetic. Uh, and that's not really a problem if there's any pain, because pain is a very subjective phenomenon. And in this, this case, of course, we use anesthetic. Um, sometimes if the patients are very tolerant, then you don't need to do that at all. So the most important in a diode laser is the speed of cut. If you if you keep the laser, which is immobile, if you keep the laser immobile, the tip immobile, you will cause carbonization. Please remember that. So your speed of cut is extremely important. The speed of cut enhances the speed of the removal of the tissues. If it is uh, if it is too quick, it won't cut anything. And if, if it's too slow, it. it will cause carbonization. And this is how it looks immediately after we open it with our lasers. The second stage opening is extremely easy with this. So the, so the left side of the patient 
is the ovium. Remember this, and the right side is the diode. Because when you see the uh, the follow up, you will you will need to see what is the difference. This is immediately after the implant opening. That's the photograph. This is one week post operative, no difference at all. And as you can see, that the healing is exactly the same. So you could use a diode laser and or an ovium laser for this particular uh, uh, procedure. Then you have the final prosthesis in the patient's mouth and the, the right side screw, we took an x-ray just to check whether the screw, screw had seated in. And so we uh, did adjust the, the prosthesis a little bit. This is the final screw and hybrid. This is the final prosthesis, the patient's mouth. This is the final prosthesis. This is the final prosthesis. This is the final prosthesis. So very good results for this particular patient. It took us a long time to do this because of the infection or in the previous implants that were placed. Case number four, this is a very, very difficult case. This patient had some mucous fibrosis. He had oral uh, 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 squamous cell carcinoma on the left cheek. So his mouth opening was very limited and that's how it looked in the patient's mouth. And so we, uh, but his, because his gingival health was pretty okay, we could attempt doing immediate implants for this patient. We did post extraction, immediate implants placed in both the, the lower and the upper, and we angulated the maxillary implants. The distal most implants were angulated. We used multi-unit apartments in the maxillary implants. We used a verification jig, final prosthesis in the patient's mouth. And this is a buckle view. And this is a final prosthesis on a CBCT. And this is before and after. For this particular patient, it was a great uh, uh, solution. As you can see, he was a brookser. He was eating all, all kinds of wonderful things like uh, the masalas and that you get. This is one more case. I'm going to go forwards in this one uh, because we just be running out of time. This is the last case I'm going to show you. It's an ectodermal dysplasia, total anodontia. I, I love showing you this case because it is something that is, we did it this, this pro bono for this patient. He couldn't afford it. He was complete anodontia, both primary and deciduous, uh, both primary and permanent dentition were, uh, uh, were, were missing. So this is a rare case, ectodermal dysplasia. We did a bone graft for this patient initially, but the patient after the bone graft had uh, tuberculosis and we lost all of the graft. So we placed zygoma implants for him in the posterior maxilla and uh, all in four on the, on, on the mandible. This is the final prosthesis, maxillary and mandibular prosthesis. And this is the final prosthesis in the patient's mouth. And this is the one year post operative. And this is the pre and post operative. This was really uh, very heartening for us because when the patient saw himself for the first time with teeth in his mouth, he cried for an hour on a dental chair. I think we are here for our patients, and that should give you and all of us the most pleasure when the patient shows happiness. To that extent. So thank you very much and if you have any questions I'll be more than happy to answer them. Samira? Samira? Yes sir. Do you have questions? Uh, yeah. Yes sir. It was a fabulous uh, presentation sir and very informative. The cases that you have done with lasers were just mind-blowing. Thank you so much. We have quite a lot of questions sir. So first, I'll take all of the questions about aerosol. Yeah. Uh, so, sir, you, you said like uh, aerosols are produced while talking, singing. So our patients, they really have a bad habit of spitting again and again. Absolutely. And, uh, and even we are, like many guidelines have been talking about giving a pre-procedural rinse to patient. So how are we going to control those aerosols? So the spitting, of course, is a big thing. So what we do in our practice is you can use betadine, povidone iodine, as a pre-procedure -mouth, uh, pre mouthwash rinse for two minutes, okay, dilute it and give it to them, and you're reducing the viral count uh, immediately, okay? You could also, if you're using a rubber dam, you can use hypochlorine around it if you're using a dam. So dam is something that you could do to reduce that. But spitting is something, that's a very good point. Indians are very uh, spitting friendly. Yeah, because some, <laughs> many times they get suffocated and they want to spit again and again. So, so they, I mean, there's nothing you can do beyond trying to stop them from spitting too much, right? Yeah. Or if you have a rubber dam, then they're not going to be able to spit. Right. So then right. another advantage is using a dam. That's another advantage. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, so, sir, uh, according to you, which is the best method, fogging, HEPA filter, or UV lights? Like many, many dentists, they cannot afford all the things. So, which one would you suggest for them to invest in the basic, the most important one? Only one thing if they have to buy, then what should they buy? HEPA filters, for sure. So, ventilation and HEPA filter is definitely the way to go. Um, we don't know the efficacy of the UV but we know the efficacy of the HEPA filters. And there's not that many studies done with this particular virus or any other, you know, with, with the UV lights. I know that they work, but we don't know how much. If you have proper ventilation and you have HEPA filters, that would be the best solution. And uh, sir, if we are using HEPA filters, then can we put on the AC? You can put on the AC, but open the windows. But if you have okay. an extractor, if you have an extractor, which is that powerful, okay. then you don't need... Uh, then you don't need, you can probably see, yes, for sure, because it's it's throwing out the air and then recirculating fresh air in. So that's the whole principle of the HEPA filter, isn't it? That you, you filter it through, the air goes out and fresh air is then gotten in. in. So if you can recirc, if you're recirculating the same air, then you might have a problem. Right. But if you're throwing out, that's why you need uh, air extractors as well. Okay. And... Um... So, sir, uh, what do you suggest? When can we start? Uh, like, what? How, when can we start doing aerosol procedures? Can you give some predictions on that? Once your clinics are equipped with all of this, and you can, you can, well, guarantee is what nobody can guarantee anything, but you can promise at least a great attempt at reducing the viral counts to to virtually zero. Because the lesser the viral counts, of course, the lesser your chances of getting infected. So whenever your clinics are prepared for this, then I think you should start. But I don't think you should start. Okay. Okay, sir. Uh, now, uh, questions on lasers. So uh, Dr. Sailesh Parikh was asking, which laser did you use when you did vestibuloplasty? I use only the erbium. I use only, only the erbium lasers, the YSDG. Okay. That, okay. Is the, that is what I, because if you're scoring the periosteum, then you cannot use a diode laser on both. So you will have to use an erbium YSDG or an erbium YAG laser that can score the periosteum. If you are not going to score the periosteum with a laser, then you can use a diode laser for the removal of, for the incision and for the removal of the fibrous tissue and then score the periosteum with a scalpel. But that is fraught with a little bit of danger because the closer you go to bone with a diode laser, there are more chances of damaging and, and causing uh, heating up of the bone and therefore you could have uh, uh, bone necrosis. So we have to be careful with that. But otherwise, if you have an erbium laser, that's beautiful because you can use both for, for the fibers and the uh, bone. And commercial name of this erbium laser? It's the bio laser. Bio -laser. What I use is the, is the bio okay. laser. And it's this can be used on bone also? Yes, absolutely. So you were using the same for all bone the surgeries? You saw. Okay. It's the water laser. Okay, okay, okay. It's called the water case. And it can be used for on, on bone as well as on soft tissues. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, sir, what is the depth of penetration of this laser? Like you did for a lateral window, you use this laser. So it won't uh, damage the underlying sinus membrane? That's a very good question. So you must understand that the erbium laser's absorption in water is very, very high. Okay, so its depth of penetration is very low. Okay. okay, so actually, because your vision is very good, one, because there's very little, uh, there's good hemostasis, there's very little bleeding, and two, because the depth of penetration is so low that you can actually see the membrane below it. Okay. So, so and, and you saw when I was doing it, I could, I actually stopped just when the membrane was being seen. And then I went a little bit after that to make sure that I don't damage the memory. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Hetul Shah is asking, how can we treat peri-implantitis with laser? That's another topic. Uh, I, I, you know, I mean, that would take me another two, three hours, but you can do, you can, you can actually, if you have an erbium laser, you can even clean the implant surface. So there are two ways. When we talk about peri-implantitis, we're talking about peri-implant mucositis, or you're talking about peri-implantitis, which involves loss of bone around this, the implant. So supporting bone, there is a bone loss around the implant. If you just have mucositis, then you can even use this diode laser because that is just soft tissue inflammation. 
Okay. Then you can use a diode laser around the implant, but be careful when you use diode lasers because you don't want to heat up the implant too much. But if you have an erbium laser, which is a colder laser, which doesn't heat up the implant surface that much, and, and, and implants love the erbium laser. I haven't seen anything that, has, that is remotely connected to and negative with an erbium laser of an implant. Then you can even go around the, you can even, actually we have done, and that's, I, I'm sorry I couldn't include that in the lecture because of the paucity of time, but we can actually clean the implant surface with the, with the erbium laser, remove the granulation tissue, remove the biofilm that forms on top of it, and then graft the bone, and we have long-term results with it. Uh, I would say the results are about 50 to 60% uh, bone growth, which is quite a lot. Uh, no, not, not, nothing in peri-implantite is 100%, and that's one of the problems that you have. So, sir, uh, what do you suggest, like in our clinic, like if we have to invest on lasers, then which one do we need to buy? Well, depends on what you want to do with it. If you are doing what, what we are doing with lasers, then you definitely need to use an obium laser. Obium. And we can uh, use it on tooth also? Absolutely. For tooth preparations? You can use it on tooth, any heart tissue. So on tooth, on bone, you can use it on. So you can use enamel, dentine, cementum, and on bone. And of course, if you buy the, the, the obium bias DG, which is a water laser, it's an all tissue laser. So you can use it for soft tissues okay. and you can use it for heart tissues. So then you need just one laser, you don't need a diode laser. Though in our practice, we have multiple lasers. We have diodes. We even have a CO2 and we also have a... Uh, okay. a yeah. So, uh, and sir, uh, this lasers, if we are using for uncovering the implant, so the heat generation, will that affect the osteointegration of implant? Not at all. Not at all. You saw that. You saw that. You, you saw that. Did one with a with a diode. You don't want to. You don't want to touch the implant surface with the laser, mm -hmm. because there are two things that will happen. If you touch the implant surface, uh, because the implant is metallic, it's not going to absorb the laser. It is going to reflect it. You can burn your tip. Okay. And, and these tips are expensive. So, you so this you are talking about diode laser. You know, any, any anything, okay. you know, diode lasers are, are cheaper okay. tips, but if you're using an erbium laser, the tips are expensive. You okay. pass that to, a, to an implant. Mm -hmm. So you don't, you don't actually, you go around the implant. Mm -hmm. You don't go on top of the implant. So that's why I'm marking off the center point of the cover screw, where your screw goes in, where the screw access hole is. Right. That's extremely important. So you mark that and then you go, then you have the dimensions of the implant. So you know exactly what circumferential diameter you need to go around and that's very easy to do okay. it's a it's a technique that needs there's a learning curve to it that's all uh, can lasers be used for uh, taking soft tissue grafts yes they can be but but the, with a proviso that when you use a laser the edges of the soft tissue graft will be burnt you can use it but i would i don't do it personally myself um, i'd rather just use a scalpel because if you're using a soft tissue graft from a laser, then you'll have to cut the edges so you get less graft than you actually would like to get. But then, sir, laser, it cut off the blood supply of the tissue. So this that graft... Is will... That is not true. It doesn't cut off the blood supply. The healing potential is it coagulates the tissues wherein you remove. So if you're doing a sub-epithelial connective tissue graft, mm -hmm. for example, or, then you can actually take it you can take the hole with the epithelium and then remove the epithelium with the laser. Okay. And, and when you and, and you're not going up to the periosteum because it's a it's a connective tissue graft. So you're above the periosteum. So that tissue underneath, which is protecting the periosteum, coagulates. And that is where your heating potential is. So a laser does not. What did you say? What what was the point? It you stops say? the button flow, like it, it disconnects no, no, the doesn't blood. disconnect the blood the supply. supply. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, and last question from Dr. Reddy, which is a very important question. What is the Dr. cost? Reddy, this is Dr. Reddy. Bhumi Reddy, Sudarshan Reddy. And so this is the most important question. What is the cost of investment of erbium YAG laser? Depends on what 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 laser you buy. I think the, the cheapest erbium laser is about 20 lakhs or something like that, plus upwards. Something like that. I, I'm, look, I'm, I'm not really sure because the last laser I bought was about five years back. So I tell you the wrong pricing, it will not be right. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. It was a wonderful session with you. And over to you, Dr. Anil Arora. Thank you, Suchitan. Wonderful as usual.
you really did justice to both the topics uh, the protocols the aerosol was really wonderful when we got to learn a lot from that and of course lasers has been your forte thanks very very much and really appreciate all your efforts and this time that you have spared for us thank you thank you so much thank you viewers thank you so much for being uh, with us for this session just want to make a couple of announcements about the next how to series which will be coming these are the next in line once you are seeing now the next one is scheduled for uh, day after tomorrow which is friday at 4 pm dr rohan bhat who will be speaking on how to select stainless steel crowns in pediatric patients a uh, very important topic according to me and uh, very technique sensitive as it is it's difficult to manage children over that to do all these kind of crown adjustments and placements and uh, you know luting all these steps will be covered in a very nice step by step procedure by dr rohan bhat on friday you also have the other how to series uh, coming up starting with monday Dr. Ratin Das, Dr. Shail Jaggi, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, that is. Dr. Garima Podda, Dr. Ritika Arora, Dr. Puhu Majumdar, Dr. Varsha Rao, Dr. Mahesh Jagwani, and finally with Dr. Harsh Shah. We look forward to you joining us on Friday at 4 p.m. Till that time, bye bye. Take care. Stay safe.